get started with our afternoon's program, which is slightly different, but hopefully you'll see the relationship we certainly do between the, the project we'll be discussing this afternoon and that we discussed this morning. So this afternoon uh, is a second JISC project that we've gotten that started a little earlier than the one we talked about this morning, but actually ends at the exact same time, which is why we're having these uh, events at the same time, because we think it appeals to the same communities, hopefully. Um, in, in March of 2008, as you can see from this press release off the JISC website, uh, JISC announced um, a series of transatlantic dig digitization projects um, that they were funding. Now, this was an effort by JISC that they're following up on. I believe the deadline for the next round is in a week or so. Okay, so the 26th, so if you've got some transatlantic digitization you need to do, you've still got an opportunity to quickly get something in. Um, that was uh, JISC and NEH offering uh, funds for groups in the U.S. and the U.K. to collaborate on digitizing new materials. Um, and also, you'll see in our case, creating tools for understanding materials that are on the web. So um, some of the, pro the, the other projects that were funded, we've got a, a digital archaeology initiative with Southampton and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. This is us that we'll be talking about, the Shakespeare Quartos from, with Oxford and the Folger Library, Philo Grid with Imperial and Tufts, and Concordia, um, King's College, London, and New York University. Now, the other projects you can see are fairly um, traditional digitization projects, more like what we heard about this morning. Um, ours is sort of the odd duck out here in some ways, and we, we are grateful to just for having seen the... Uh, value of the project that we proposed, which we knew from the beginning wasn't a typical digitization project because we weren't digitizing materials in the sense that we were you know, scanning pages of things and, and putting them on the web. Instead, uh, the partners in this project, um, the OII, um, Hanzo, uh, Hanzo Archives Limited, and the Internet Archive in the US, um, started from the proposition that there's all this information in the Internet Archive. Uh, most of you are familiar, hopefully at least a little bit with the Internet Archive, you may know it as the Wayback Machine. Um, they've been crawling the web for, uh, since 1996, I believe, is when they first started. They've got material going back to 1996. We've got a large team of people here from the Internet Archive. I think five people came over for this. Um, several of them here in the front row, and you'll be hearing people speak. So the, if, if you've ever wanted to meet the Internet Archive people, this is your chance, because you've got them here in the room. Um, if you have any uh, comments of ways you'd like to be able to use it. Now, one of the things about the Internet Archive is they know, and everybody else knows, that the current interface of the Wayback Machine is very useful for finding individual websites, because you can put in URLs and you can find different saves of websites over time. Um, but it's less useful if you want to do analysis of large collections or extract data from that and, and try to um, look at uh, maybe change over time or some of the other things that you can do with these web um, archives that are out there. And they've been have a number of efforts at built it, building better tools for this, at extracting this data from the archive, and we're just one of the projects that they've got going on, uh, partnerships with, um, among a number. So what we were doing is uh, building some better tools for extracting data from the web archive, being able to search it, analyze it, and, ex and use it for other purposes than simply looking up individual URLs. So in the World Wide Web of Humanities project, we um, have built a number of tools, tools that you'll be hearing about today, and we built two demonstrator collections, uh, one on World War I and one on World War II. And Christy Madsen will be talking a little bit in a minute about how we came up with these collections, how we assembled them. Then uh, the representatives from the Internet Archive will be talking about the work that they've done on extracting these collections and building them. And then finally, our partners from Hanzo will be talking about the tools that they built using open source tools for actually being able to search and work with archives. And um, hopefully one of the things that we'll be able to get into these talks is also the overall uh, necessity for understanding web archives and using web archives for research and for as a, another form of digitized scholarly material that's actually born digital but still needs to be um, managed and controlled and transformed in interesting ways to be able to make it usable for the kinds of research that needs to happen. So let me start by turning it over to uh, Christine Madsen who's a doctoral student at the Oxford Internet Institute and has been quite um, involved in, do it, in helping build the collection that we put up. Um, some folks from the Internet Archive and um, Hanzo, as Eric mentioned, are going to speak a little bit about <clears throat> excuse me, um, the tools and the analysis of the collection. So I thought I'd start a little bit with talking about how we settled on the topics for the collections and how we actually assembled the, the collections that we studied. Um, we felt that because of the involvement of so many countries, the materials available um, from the two world wars that were on the web represent a well-rounded set of materials. 
um, as well as many branches of the humanities, which would allow us to test the tools that were going to be built against a wide variety of documents and resources. Also seemed appropriate for a transatlantic collaboration. Um, the types of materials that are available from these sites also cover a range of challenges that we um, hoped would allow for robust testing of our approach. There are multiple document formats, including HTML and other kinds of structured text, images of documents, photographs, audio and video. We also recognized that this topic spanned multiple types of collections. So we had government resources, personal collections, university collections, library and museum collections. And we imagined that there was a wide potential audience for the materials on the world wars. Um, so it could have relevance not only for scholars, but for teachers in secondary, um, of secondary and higher education, further education courses, as well as for amateurs and independent scholars. So we hoped all of this would lead to an interesting test case for analyzing the collection that we were going to build. And if nothing else, we thought um, we'd be able to get some data from extracting the breakdown of languages, document types, top level and second level domains, and then analyzing each of these, um, how each of these might have changed over time in, from the data available in the archive, but also how each might differ between World War I and World War II. How is the coverage of each topic different? So, there's really a three-step process in building the collection. Um, the sites were first selected from the live web. They were then harvested from the Internet Archive. And then the identified collection was supplemented with keyword searches and crawls from within the archive. So I'm going to speak mainly about this first process, the actual process of selection. So selections started with identifying a set of seed sites. And in essence, a seed is the website or portion of website that you plan to include in your collection. So this is the content that you want. And we'll refer probably, all of us today, will refer a lot to seeds. So I thought it would be nice to just set out a little definition of that. Um, <clears throat> but a seed site also has another purpose, because it's a site from which additional sites can be discovered via the hyperlinks of the site. They're in-links and out-links from the seed site itself. So the kinds of things Mike Thelwell spoke about this morning, doing in-link analysis and identifying the links to and from um, websites as part of that web metrics techniques. Um, so we can use the seeds to then identify other relevant content that you might not have found otherwise. So we started with World War I as our initial topic. And early on in the selection process, so this was the idea of selecting these seed, seed sites, um, we realized our selection policy was actually not going to result in anything close to the original target of 100 million to 250 million pages. Um, the first few passes through the collections yielded just barely a million pages, um, which was a, a bit shy of 250 million. Um, so in the end, our collections are smaller than the total possible limits for um, that, that we could have selected. But um, that for the purposes of the technological implementation, um, but we knew we still had to expand beyond what we were finding initially. Um, so we expanded the collection to World War II as well. Um, and the final collection contains over 5 million unique uh, URLs. So the actual list of seeds that was provided to the Internet Archive team for harvesting were identified in a process that began with simple topic web-based searches. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The searches started with the most general topics, World War I, World War II, but being sure to include all variations in language, spelling, and phrasing. <coughs> so being able to, making sure to include things like First World War. Um, and then this was followed by searching regional localizations of the phrases and topics such as the Great War or um, French, German, other foreign language translations. So for each search that was conducted, um, the first 20 pages of the search results were captured by following the links from the search results page and copying and pasting URLs into a spreadsheet. Um, sites with large lists of links to other relevant sites known as hubs, which we'll also probably talk about today. 
were bookmarked and returned to at a later time um, for further exploration and capture of those links. As the goal was to gather a collection though, of archived website, we had to make sure that to include links regardless of whether or not they were live or not. And this was one of the few ways we had to get into actual content um, that no longer existed on the web. So in some ways it was kind of nice to find dead links because you knew it would give you a little more variation in the data and be able to provide access to things that did, didn't exist today. So once this initial collection, um, this initial list of links, this, this database of links was gathered, the next step was to expand the scope. And one of the ways to do this was by generalizing the URLs that were provided. So for each URL copied, it meant looking at the URL, deciding is everything on that domain, does everything on that domain fall within scope of the collection? So it's pretty obvious to um, see that something called greatwar.co.uk is probably the entire collection is relevant, the entire site's relevant. So that URL was truncated um, all the way back to the domain. For a lot of the collections that were in libraries and museums and archives, there was oftentimes, you couldn't go all the way back, there were no unique domains. So you had to look and see what was the most logical directory that you could truncate back to. Um, so in American Memory Collection on World War II, um, we didn't want to collect, have to, to mark every single page. So if we provided the seed as everything within that directory that, that ends in World War II, then the Internet Archive knew they could just grab everything in the, that, that fell in that directory. Which of course means that illogical or flat directory, directory stru structures, excuse me, were a problem um, for a number of sites. So Eyewitness to History is a, I was, Eyewitness to History.com is a site that contains first person accounts of historical events uh, and has about 50 pages dedicated to the First and Second World Wars, but it has several thousand pages overall. So we didn't want the, the entire site. But every page is just a single, there's no organization of these pages within their site. Everything is just, it's a flat structure, flat organization. Um, so it meant going through and, and actually trying to look at those pages, identify them and in order to provide them. So after the, repeating this process on those initial searches, um, it became pretty clear when at some point your searches are really only providing redundant materials. And, and I s tried lots of different search engines and, and various things. Um, but at, at some point, you just, it's clear you, you just keep getting the same material over and over again. So at that point, more precise search terms were selected and the process was reinitiated. Um, narrower topic searches were commonly either biographical, things like looking at particular names, Hitler, Churchill, et cetera, um, or specific events, Battle of Midway, Guadalcanal, um, or based on subjects that, while technically broader, um, were commonly associated with one of the two wars. So looking up allies, home front, Holocaust. Materials in foreign language, um, because this process is, um, as you can imagine, fairly time consuming, we decided to narrow the collection, or at least to um, focus the, the collection of foreign language materials on um, German sites. So with the idea that it would be more useful to have one language, a, a deep collection in one particular language that, other than English, than to have many shallow ones. So we consulted with native German speakers who helped design a search strategy to maximize the number of resulting German sites. Um, and this strategy took into account local conventions, um, such as not speaking only of World War II, but more commonly of the period in which the Nazis ruled, or the period of National Socialism. So this, this approach illustrated the need for localization, not just translation, when you're looking at materials in foreign languages. So other materials in other foreign languages were include, included when we came across them, but we didn't actively seek them out. Um, and despite not actively seeking them out, we ended up with materials in at least 24 other languages. Um, although this depends on having the language set in the meta tags. And so um, if the language is, at least this, this data, 
depends on that. So if, if the language wasn't set, we don't actually know about it. So this is just a rough estimate, and we know there's at least 24. So as the topics um, for development were narrowed, so as we sort of narrowed in more and more on how to gather more and more pages, um, the collection of seed sites continued to grow, but there were still several content areas that remained difficult to include. And this included a majority of material from museums, libraries, and archives um, that weren't commonly findable um, by general subject searches because they're in databases um, that aren't necessarily exposed to general search engines. And this is a real shame because this is very high quality content that we wanted to include. So most of this material had to be identified using targeted searches of key domains likely to contain relevant content. In other words, it meant sort of guessing at where you think there might be good content, going to their site, and searching for it. So the New York Public Library, for example, has an extensive collection of photographs, over 2,100 of which are relevant to the World Wars. But these materials can really only be found by um, going to the New York Public Library site and doing relevant subject searches. Similarly, Harvard has a collection of almost 1,000 digitized pamphlets from World War I, but they can only be found by searching the library's union catalog. In each of these cases, knowing that the material exists is a prerequisite for being able to find it, and that's a real problem for identifying these collections. And even when they're located, materials in databases remain problematic. Um, so there's usually no directory structures that can capture a number of items at once, um, nor are the URLs generated by database searches commonly stable. So URLs to the Harvard materials, for example, um, end in an object identifier, but if you follow this link at the bottom, it takes you to the first page of a multi-page object, and you have to know the, um, essentially the, the pattern string for identifying the subsequent pages in order to really get access to that material. Um, so I, I think we did, you know, um, everyone from the rest of today will talk a little bit more about this process, and I think we did the best we can in terms of identifying material um, but I think there is still an imbalance of the kinds of materials that we were able to capture because somebody putting up um, a website who didn't necessarily think to put it in a database, in some ways that, that material is a lot more accessible to us than um, material that might otherwise be in a beautifully structured database but that has um, illogical URLs. So now I'll turn it over to um, folks to talk about how the tools were built um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit, just give you a brief introduction to Internet Archive, in case you're not familiar with us. Then we're also going to talk about the um, extraction process itself for this project, what we learned, what we can do better in the future, and just talk about <clears throat> some future research for tools and development. So Internet Archive is a digital library. All of our holdings are um, digitized, they're online, they're freely accessible. Um, open to anybody, the general public, scholars, anybody, and it's all available at archive.org. We started by just collecting web pages that date back to 1996, and since then our collections have grown to include digitized music, moving images, audio files, books, software, images. We try to get just about everything and anything we can get our hands on. So we get about 6 million downloads a day, and we have approximately 4 petabytes of data <coughs> compressed. Uh, the web archives, which we're going to talk about more specifically today, is our general web archive. Um, it's a broad snapshot of the web that we've been taking since 1996. Right now, the collection comprises approximately 150 billion URLs. Uh, we have representation from about 85 million websites. Um, we've got content from every domain in, in at least 40 languages. Moving forward, we're going to be capturing approximately half a petabyte to a petabyte every year. Um, just aside from the General Web Archive, we do crawling for partners, national libraries, um, university libraries, and other partners. So our collection is, is growing, growing, growing. We've got 1.6 petabytes right now. Um, if you want to get an idea of the size, we're doing a project with Sun where we're putting a copy of our general web archive into a shipping container. So you can think about how much is a petabyte of data. It's about the size of a shipping container. 
Uh, so now to talk directly about um, the case study we did for this project. What we were doing is looking at, as Christine mentioned, looking at the general web archive, which is huge and expansive and has lots of content in it, but trying to pull out a very focused set of data on a specific theme and following those websites over time. So the end result was the World War I, World War II case study. We have a, um, a web page uh, where you can access the data that was extracted. We have it broken up into sections, World War I, World War II. It's all indexed for a full text search and browsable by URL. And I'll have this URL at the end of the presentation as well. So the entire collection, as Christine mentions, it's over 5 million unique URLs. But since URLs are captured over time, dating back to 1996, we actually have over 23 million captures. The date range of the collection is May 96 to August 2008. And we've got about 250 gigabytes of data in this small focused collection. So the actual process, which Christine touched on, um, once Christine and her team selected the URLs, we took that target set of seed sites and looked through the general Wayback. We identified all the different captures of all those different seeds and, ex and extracted those. We also identified all of the images and files that were embedded on the seed sites themselves and prepared those for extraction as well. We also, I'm sorry, it's a little cut off, but um, we also attempted to locate uh, additional candidate seed URLs through some inbound, outbound link analysis. So this was sort of what we decided to do for the scope of collection. Again, the purpose was to create a really quality collection of uh, specific URLs focused around this topic. Um, since we didn't capture as many, as many sort of what would normally be out of scope links, we did have some issues around that. So relevant URLs that were not identified as seeds were not extracted. So what this means is you'll be looking at a web page, and I have an example in just a moment, that has links to other resources that have to do with World War I or World War II, but they actually weren't captured because they weren't identified as seeds. So that was one of the major challenges of this project and one of the biggest uh, lessons learned that we have. Uh, talking to talk a little bit about the options around this kind of issue, um, there's a couple ways that you can proceed with this sort of collection. You can automatically harvest all of the outbound links from your seed sites. So take your seed sites and then capture all of the links off of those seed sites. And then you'd be sure to, to get all of the relevant content that's not listed as a seed. However, you could also end up with a tremendous amount of information that has nothing to do with your topic. And this could come up in search results, it could be bad for your user experience, it could be, it could be more trouble than it's worth. The other alternative is to create a highly curated collection where you analyze all of the inbound and outbound link information for relevancy. And to do this, you'd have people actually clicking through, evaluating the links, deciding if they're relevant to the project, and then putting them back into the collection, into the seed list. Um, due to the sheer volume of links that you can have, this is and can be a very overwhelming task. I think Christine mentioned how much of her process she went through just to create the seed lists. You can imagine how much more work that could be if you were clicking through every single link to find the ones that were relevant and weed out the ones that weren't. So, but the end result would be a very highly curated collection with every single link working. At this point in time, and this is one of the things we really learned from this project, we don't have an in-between automated approach. Um, and so that's one of the things we want to work on for future development of these sorts of projects. But to look through the uh, ca individual case studies, first World War I, there was approximately 2,200 seeds, 900 unique hosts within those seeds, and the number of links just within the World War I data set, 143 million. Here's an example from our webpage. It's one of the featured links. Uh, we also have access to all of the, um, the seed websites that you can click through from the link list. And here's an example of one of the extracted pages. So it's some first town accounts by one of the Doughboys of World War I. So here's, here's his happy face. If you scroll down the screen, you'd see links to the actual articles that he had written um, and had published in various newspapers. So the trouble with this extraction is 
most of these links, which all are relevant and have to do with this website, they actually weren't captured because they weren't included in the seed, uh, in the seed list itself. So you end up coming to this error message. Now, one of the ways that we tried to uh, work with this challenge through the access is we created this link back into the Global Wayback Service. So back into the expansive collection to see if that URL was in there. And so that's where you see I have it circled the <coughs> Global Wayback Service. It's actually a link. And you can click that. And yes, we do have the article. It's in the giant collection as opposed to have been included in the focus collection. Moving on to World War II, uh, slightly more seeds, 2,500 seeds, a lot more hosts within those seeds, and a lot more links within that collection. And here's an example from that collection, uh, again with the link list. And here's the example, um, this is from the School of Journalism at Indiana University. And here's an example where the scoping and the extraction really worked quite effectively for the way that we had set out. All of this information, this is another journalist who wrote a number of columns from the front lines. And if you scroll down the page, you can see that all of these columns were archived. We even have the audio content uh, from somebody reading the column out loud. And all of the images are there. There's no off-linking to other sites that weren't extracted. So this actually worked very effectively, where we were able <coughs> to take a cohesive piece of content and move it into the focus collection from the Wayback Machine. Here's a few more images of his columns. So the challenges moving out of this process, um, probably the biggest challenge we face is identifying the subject matter that lends itself well to this sort of extraction, determining the scoping around that identification, and then automating the process. So it can be really easy for anybody to dig into our huge expansive collection and pull out a focused piece of material. So what do we need for this? We have we need tools for the workflow that could work with the initial scoping and extraction. And then we need some tools around collection building and access. We found when we were showing uh, the interface to humanities scholars in our area that they had a lot of problems interacting with the collection because of its technical focus. They got very frustrated with you know, the, the error messages and they couldn't follow through to the general web archive. So we can really work to make that experience a lot more or a lot less technically focused, so anybody could walk up and use it. So some ideas for uh, future research and tools development efforts. What would make this process easier is link and web graphing tools that would really take the inbound and outbound data and present it in a really uh, easy to use way that could show these hubs a lot more effectively and the further areas of interest where you might find a website that was not even on your radar but look, all of this information is linking in and out of it. So yes, I want to include that in the general collection. So exposing that kind of information would be really helpful for the collection development process. And then also, we could find um, more ways to provide access to these sorts of collections. Right now, Internet Archive is focused on search by keyword and search by URL. But that doesn't even take into an account the time period that's covered with these collections and how much resources can change on the web and how quickly and how we can be having different snapshots in time of the information. So getting that into the navigational paradigm would be really helpful, as well as having a way to show the end user all of the curator's work that went into building the collection initially. So a few tools that are out there right now, and tools are built for these sorts of purposes for individual projects. Um, but they don't always come together, and they're not always as general to be applied to projects across different subject areas. So this is the nomination tool that Library of Congress has used in the past. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they used this tool uh, building a collection of end-of-term websites for the presidential transition in, in the US. And it was a, a tool that people could use from different areas geographically. And they basically would submit URLs that they shot thought should be included in this project, and then people could vote on them, and people could also add metadata explaining why they thought the website was important, um, you know, or just general information about the websites themselves. So you can see a little in the screenshot here, who nominated the URLs, their comments, things like that. There's also the Zotero tool, which could be a tool like that could be applied 
quite easily to sort of distributed networks of collection builders where, again, you select a website that you think should be included in either an extraction or a live web archiving project and collect it as part of a bookmark and then people are able to share and exchange that information. So these are just a couple of examples of where <laughs> tools development could, be go, could go. Overall, these uh, web archiving projects, either in live web crawling or extractions, provide a lot of opportunities for scholars and the general public. Uh, they make it easier, these are just a few reasons, they make it easier for humanities scholars to find and assemble new materials of interest that maybe they wouldn't have been exposed to in the past. Also, because of web content is so diverse in its nature, and because the general web archive in particular has so much historical depth in terms of the internet, uh, doing a, a web extraction could add and augment a lot of additional information to supplement print materials or other digitized projects that are out there. And we find that these extractions and web archiving in general brings a lot of people together. It's a good opportunity for collaboration across continents across the world, as we did here. <laughs> just brings people together. Um, it's true, though. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good opportunity for people to collaborate. So that's mine. Thank you very much. And I should also mention, um, one of our partners from the Internet Archive wasn't able to make it, Chris Carpenter Nicolescu, because she gave birth to a baby girl on Friday um, and didn't want to get on a plane and come here right after that. <laughs> I'm Mark Middleton. Uh, Hanzo uh, is a, a small UK company uh, focused on web archiving for commercial uh, purposes. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the tools that we uh, have implemented to take the extracted data from the Internet Archive and to try to manipulate that data and graph it and, and generally play with it. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we've published those as open source, so I'll explain that, and uh, then I'll talk about some of the next steps that we're hoping to do um, in in future research. So first, uh, I'll because uh, everybody knows uh, the, the Internet Archive, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I've got a slide just to say who we are. Um, so we we archive company websites, so the companies pay us to do this. Uh, so uh, it's primarily for legal reasons, if you can imagine, if you're a, a bank and you're being sued by investors, well, you, the banks are our friends in this, in this case. So they, they, they pay us to archive their, their websites, and they can use that as evidence in court for how they, they really did uh, uh, promote their, their investments at the time. Uh, so that's basically what, what we do. Um, and uh, to do that, we have to deal with a very current uh, web technology. We have to stay uh, up to speed in, in uh, some very advanced uh, things. And we're also obliged to collect absolutely everything. And it all has to work beautifully and so on. So things like flash and, and video and interactive dynamic content and so on, we have to deal with that. So we have uh, uh, people working on uh, advancing our web crawling and access tools all the time, we do an awful lot of software development. And underpinning that, we, we have a couple of uh, open source projects, um, which is uh, our way of trying to tap into the, the larger community of developers around the world and also to help uh, contribute towards web archiving standards. And it's on that basis that we, we entered into this project. So the objectives for our part of, of the project were to uh, develop a, a search engine for web archive files. Um, it's quite it's relatively straightforward to collect websites. Uh, there's a range of, of uh, crawlers out there to do that. But to be able to then search and browse that content is not so straightforward. If you're a large institution, you can obtain uh, uh, software to do that, but it's, it is pretty complex and you, you need staff to do it. Um, and what we wanted to do is build a very simple, easy to install and deploy uh, tool set to allow uh, a researcher to do the same without the institutional support. Uh, so we uh, have put together uh, this search engine with another hands-up project uh, called Wark Tools, uh, and we use those to uh, well, to deliver what I'm going to show you today. 
One of the uh, main aims of the project is to provide a toolkit for uh, analysis tools developers. Uh, so if there are any people out here from, from a programming background who are interested in building analysis tools on web data, this, this might be interesting for you um, because it allows you to do that kind of work based on standard web archive files. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll move on to, to describe some of those. So the first part is um, full text search. Uh, we've implemented a, a search engine uh, on top of our pre-existing web archive tool set um, that uh, basically allows you to index that uh, web archive content and then search the full text of that content. And it's very easy, very simple to do. You can download it, unzip it, install it, run it, and, and it, it works. Uh, we reviewed a, a number of uh, search engines to do this, uh, and we've selected one called Ferret, which I'll describe shortly. Um, and uh, one of the, the main criteria for selecting that search engine, obviously there's speed and, and various other things, but it's also there needs to be an active development community behind it because we, we need to uh, uh, stay with it in the, in the search community. So overall, the uh, architecture of, of this system uh, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, you see the web user interface. Uh, you can perform full text search. And then with the results of that search, you can perform some simple analytical applications on it, such as uh, building frequency tables of various metadata uh, you've collected, but also graphing them and being able to manipulate the graphs in some way. Uh, below that, we have the application engine. It's a Python uh, application, uh, and we have a, a, a caching system to, to help uh, with performance on that. And beneath that, we have the full-text search engine, which is based around Ferret. We've also built a knowledge base to uh, hold the results, uh, and we have a plugin to enable you to, a plugin architecture rather, to enable you to add analytics applications into this. Um, and we've, we've, we've built four or five, uh, and, and it's easy to, to add additional ones. So Ferret is, uh, is pretty fast. Uh, Lucene is a, a, a popular web search engine. Um, Ferret is, uh, is implemented in C, um, and it's extremely fast. And I think that's really important uh, for analytics because it, um, you, you need to be able to work with the data in, in real time. And you, you, you know, if, if you're uh, searching across a very large collection, uh, as we've discussed here, uh, it, it, speed is very important. Uh, there's a number of uh, different uh, directives uh, in the search engine. So as well as typing in words and phrases, uh, you can use symbols to make certain words or phrases uh, mandatory. You can use combinations of different Boolean logic. And you can also uh, add directives to uh, search uh, metadata uh, parts of the uh, content, such as URL and date and tag, which is very important, again, for, for narrowing down uh, the search results. Because if you, if you have... Uh, you know, half a million URLs, you, you, you need to be pretty focused in your searching before you start plotting graphs. Uh, so working with the data, um, we, we took the, uh, the Internet Archive, uh, archive extraction, um, consisted of some three and a half thousand archive files, and we had to migrate them from the original uh, arch uh, file format into the newer uh, ISO standard WARC format, uh, and we used our tools for that, and we, we, we had a lot of challenges because they're, they're, they're very old. They're, they, they go back to some of the earliest uh, collections at the archives, so there were quite a few problems. We had to find ways to, to fix or work around some of these broken arcs, and I, and I believe we, we did some, we exchanged quite a lot of emails about that. Um, but we, we got there eventually, and only after that were we able to index the collection. And I think fixing that and indexing it was, was a, a couple of months' work. So now that we had it and we've indexed it, we have programmable access to the data. Uh, and this is a, um, a very important 
part of, of this tool set. Um, the, 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 it's presented as a, a REST API uh, and a collection of C-based tools that you can run both on the command line but also web applications written in Python and Ruby that wrap these tools so you can run them as web applications as well. Um, we have some iterators in the code, so it will allow you to uh, start with a, a collection and iterate through that collection and perform functions again on that collection as you go through it. And, uh, they're all extremely fast, um, written in C, uh, so that we can you, you, you get a pretty good performance from it. So uh, this is in place of a demonstration. I'm nervous of doing a live demonstration, but I will do it uh, after this if you want to see anything uh, running. But it's uh, also it's on this URL, um, which I can share with you. So a very simple interface to start with. Type in some keywords. Uh, you get your results. Um, what you can find is uh, for most uh, searches, you, you, you have millions of results to start with, and you, you really have to pare it down by by um, thinking thinking through carefully what you're searching for. Once you've done that, there's four buttons at the top of the results section there, and these buttons open up um, a series of uh, analysis tools. Um, at the moment, we, we focused on using uh, e either building our own analysis tools, very simple ones, or using uh, some open source tools. Uh, for the purpose of demonstrating uh, the underlying toolkit. Uh, so the first ones are a set of frequency tables that can just tell you how many uh, domains are in the collection or uh, different, you know, what types of data are in the collection or countries. Uh, and there's also a series of graphing tools. These are open source tools. Uh, Guess, Graphis, and Hypergraph are all uh, open source. Um, the first two, uh, they, you basically, you can run the application and it delivers an XML file. You then have to load the XML file uh, into the graphing tool running on your desktop, and then you can manipulate uh, the data. And Hypergraph, uh, until about two hours ago, uh, runs in the browser. And uh, <laughs> strangely, uh, two hours ago, it stopped, and we're, we're, we're calling in the authorities for that one. Um, so this is how you launch the, the analytics tools. And I'll, I'll try to cut out of the presentation and do a demo of it uh, against better judgment uh, in a second. And the graphing tools. So uh, future development, um, we, I think it's really important to uh, find the right set of uh, iterators and, and APIs for uh, analytics tools. We, uh, we don't build analytics tools generally, uh, and this is a toolkit for people who do build analytics tools. So one of the things we're going to be doing shortly is uh, um, trying to reach out to the community and to uh, find out how we can enhance uh, our APIs and, and so on to uh, advance that. Uh, we also want to work more on the time dimension uh, and, and essentially build in some kind of uh, animation uh, capability in the graphing so we can see uh, the emergence of uh, groups and nodes and so on in, 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 the, in the graphs. So, but the key part really is, or the link to it, is, is, is getting the, the dissemination right. So starting with this event, but also we're publishing the code we're going to be uh, writing to uh, tools developers and encouraging them to, to use this uh, to, um, to, to encourage them to, to use web archives as, as the basis of, uh, of, of web research. Uh, in tools development, um, the aim with this is to, is to get the, the basic functionality right, and we've got that, and it's a very small footprint, so you can run it on, a, on, on your desktop machine. Uh, you, can, you can get a, a web archive collection uh, and uh, run it on your machine, run, run these tools on the machine, and you can do quite a lot of work with it. Uh, and we want to uh, expand that into a, a server model as well. So we want to be able to have multi-machine versions of this. Because when you start um, graphing and performing uh, rigorous analytics on 
large data sets, you're, you're going to need some multi-machine capability to, to do that. Uh, the, uh, another key point I want to uh, mention here is that um, uh, we, we, want to we want to create installation tools. Uh, this, this, the, the tools as they are uh, are a, a bit raw. They're, they're written by computer scientists. Uh, if, you, if, if you're a developer, you, you, you should be able to get, get it running in a couple of hours. If you're not a developer, you know, where, where do you start? Um, we are going to ship these with installation tools for Linux and, and Mac and, and Windows, so you can, you can create these. And I'm hoping also within a few months we'll have a, a CD-ROMable version. So you'll be able to take a web archive, a collection of WARC files, uh, run some command lines, and, and basically get a, a, a CD-ROMable version of this uh, thing, and you can put it, put the CD in on on a computer and 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 search and and uh, uh, play around with your web web archive collection. Okay, so uh, at the end of this month, uh, deliverables from this this project, uh, we're going to have the source code uh, on Google Code. Uh, most of it's already there. Uh, we just need to commit the latest. Uh, uh, the latest uh, versions, uh, and hopefully two hours from now, a fix to the problem from two hours ago. Um, some documentation. Uh, there's an issue management system, so if anybody does use it and play with it, uh, and you find some issues or you want some enhancements to it, just use that. Uh, use the mailing list to contact us. Um, it, uh, this tool uh, is based on top of another one called Work Tools, and uh, uh, the URL for that is, is there. Um, and in fact, the, the WARC tools is easy to find in Google. If you Google WARC tools, there's only one or two places to go, and, and this is one of them. And the prototype application with the current version is, is on that uh, URL, so www.oh.handsofarchives.com, uh, and uh, um, you're welcome to, to try that at any time. Um, so I just maybe, I, I don't know what I'm, how am I for time, but I can do a quick quick demo with a bit of luck um, set up there. So um, uh, you spoke about Jack the Ripper. And interestingly, he, uh, he also took part in the war. Um, so Jack the Ripper was, uh, we found, was, a, was a, a bomber in 91st Bomb Group. <laughs> uh, so there are 555 results with Jack the Ripper. Uh, and uh, I don't know um, how, how good these uh, Well, he strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. So there we go. So this is, uh, oh, we have, we have some. But we don't. We can't hear the audio. But it seems that there's some, some audio there as well. Uh, so uh, this is this is taking the uh, collection extracted from the Internet Archive. Uh, we've played with it uh, with our tools, and we've migrated it to WARC. We've ingested it into the application. We index it. We search it. and We can browse it. So the whole thing comes with a web archive browser as well. So you can, you know, if you you, you can either crawl websites uh, and and you can browse them with this, or you can obtain them from other archives like Internet Archive or us or some of the national libraries. Uh, the, there's a lot of people from the British Library and uh, um, you, can, you can get uh, content from them as well. And this will be enable you to search it and browse it on your own desktop if you can obtain the material. Uh, so, so that's that. And if I just try a couple of these, they're, they're very simple. Um, but this one is basically counting uh, the domains. Um, so uh, there's the uh, top level domains and there's a table of uh, um, second level domains um, with content in the archive. So building frequency tables and so on like this is, is relatively straightforward. Uh, and uh, the ones we've built are, are simple to just to basically demonstrate the tool works. Um, and graphing is, is uh, also uh, something useful. Let me just see if I can pare this down. Um, if I can, uh, I'll take out, 
Um, there's a f the, the, the search engine is called Ferret, and there's a Ferret query language, which is worth learning if you're going to do anything um, serious. So if I take out uh, the, the phrase bomb group, Then we're 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 more or less in in, in in you know real Jack the Ripper territory, uh, and if I um, and try to force it to include Whitechapel, pare it down a bit more. No, it goes up. <laughs> <laughs> I I know why. It's because I need to say, definitely include that, don't include that, definitely include that. So that should be smaller. And there we go. Now it won't take so long to graph it. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, the one that I, I wanted to demo today isn't working. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, this, is, this is hypergraph. It's a, basically, hypergraph is a, a, a very cool thing to look at. And uh, it, it, it's a, an applet, runs in the browser. Currently, it only runs on uh, open JDK. It doesn't work on some JDK, so uh, I can't demo it today. Um, but it, it did work uh, previously. Uh, the, the other um, applications, Guess and, and Graphis, um, they're, they're, they're open source projects. You can download them. Uh, I know they run on, on Mac. Uh, and there's, there's plenty out there that run on Windows, and if you want us to support them, just you know, email us and, and we'll do it. But basically, uh, follow these URLs on, from this project and you can, you can uh, download them for your computer and try them out. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the demo. I, um, the, the key thing is not working, so I can't show you today, but it should be there hopefully soon and you can look at it yourself directly. Okay.